And as we begin this morning, let's get you caught up. Cases of the coronavirus now top 1.2 million, more than 71,000 deaths. That's in this country. And nearly two months since the social distancing measures began, 36 states now are starting to lift those restrictions. Also this morning, the U.S. Treasury Secretary is warning Americans that international travel may not resume this year. Meantime, one public school in Montana will become one of the first in the country to reopen since the lockdown when students return to class tomorrow. Savannah. And also tomorrow, Tyson Foods is set to resume limited production at a pork plant in Iowa. It's largest in the country. That facility had to be shut down two weeks ago to contain an outbreak of the virus. We've got complete coverage for you this morning. Let's start at the White House. NBC's Peter Alexander on duty for us. Hey, Peter, good morning. Hey, Savannah, good morning. The president will meet with the governor of Iowa here at the White House today. And even as the coronavirus grows nationwide, this crisis expanding, the death toll climbing, the president just announced plans to wind down his coronavirus task force in the next several weeks. Asked if this is the right time to disband that task force, the president said we cannot keep the country closed for years. President Trump conceding as states start reopening for business, more Americans may lose their lives, telling ABC News. It's possible there will be some because you won't be locked into an apartment or a, or a house or whatever it is. But at the same time, we're going to practice social distancing. The president on his first trip aboard Air Force One in more than five weeks saying he's winding down the White House coronavirus task force, even as the death toll in the U.S. climbs past 70,000. Mike Pence and the task force have done a great job, but we're now looking at a little bit of a different form, and that form is safety and opening, and we'll, uh, we'll have a different group probably set up for that. Some Democrats already criticizing the move. Former presidential candidate Bernie Sanders calling it an American tragedy. The president insisting this is not a mission accomplished moment. No, no, not at all. The mission accomplished is when it's over. President Trump in Arizona touring a factory now producing N95 masks while not wearing one himself. A White House aide says plant officials told them the president and his team did not need to. The president acknowledging the death toll will exceed his expectations. I always felt 60, 65, 70, as, as horrible as that is. I mean, you're talking about filling up Yankee Stadium with death. So I thought it was horrible, but it's probably going to be somewhat higher than that. It comes as Dr. Rick Bright, who was recently forced out as head of the agency involved in developing a vaccine for the virus, is breaking his silence. In this new whistleblower complaint obtained by NBC News, Bright says he was retaliated against for resisting efforts to fund potentially dangerous drugs promoted by those with political connections. A reference to hydroxychloroquine, an anti-malaria drug that the president's repeatedly promoted. Time after time, I was pressured to ignore or dismiss expert and scientific recommendations, and instead to award lucrative contracts based on political connection. In other words, I was pressured to let politics and cronyism drive decisions. The Health and Human Services Department in a statement says Dr. Bright was transferred to a position at the National Institutes of Health to work on testing. They say they are, quote, deeply disappointed that he has not shown up to that job. Dr. Bright's legal team tells us that he's been on sick leave due to hypertension caused by the current situation. Savannah. All right, Peter, uh, we want to bring in NBC News medical correspondent Dr. John Torres into the conversation. But, but Peter, I mean, let's talk about the winding down of the coronavirus task force. The members of the task force are still working, correct? But this is, I guess, a different emphasis from the White House? Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. The president likely still to have meetings with Dr. Fauci and Burks on occasion. The risk for the president is that the decision to wind down this task force appears out of step with where voters are when it comes to the seriousness of their concerns about this virus. Saying that you're winding down the task force, you know, that sends a signal. Our most recent NBC News Wall Street Journal poll shows that strong majorities of voters say right now that they are more concerned about the virus than they are the economy. And they say that they're worried that someone in their own family would catch it. Savannah. All right, Peter. And that brings us to Dr. Torres. Uh, Dr. Torres, you don't do politics, you do medicine. What impact, if any, do you think this has in terms of public health, which has a lot to do with, with the message that you're sending? 
And Savannah, I think this is unfortunately going to have a big impact because what I've learned from my experience, both military and civilian, is in the midst of something like this, you need two things. You need a command element, you need a centralized authority that can make decisions. And number two, probably more importantly, you don't want to change that midstream. And what he had talked about is that he didn't need this task force anymore because we're going to start opening the economy. I would argue that this is a time you need it more than any other time because opening the economy is going to be complex and you need to make sure we're doing it in a very healthy fashion. And if things do start cropping up, you have that instant feedback, that instant attention, and that instant communication where you can make sure that everybody understands what we need to do to keep those, out, those outbreaks from getting out of control and getting back to where we are right now. All right, Dr. Torres, it's such a delicate time. Appreciate your perspective, Peter. Thanks to you as well. Hoda, send it to you at 7.08. All right, Savannah. Also this morning, the nation's meat shortage is worsening. Supplies are down. Prices going up by as much as 25 percent. And it appears more Wendy's than first realized are without beef for burgers. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez is outside one of the fast food restaurants right here in New York City. Hey, Gabe, good morning. Hoda, good morning. The company with that unforgettable catchphrase decades ago is now having trouble finding the beef. But it's not just fast food. One butcher shop owner we spoke with said that he has never seen such a sudden spike in meat prices. You're out of beef then? Out of patties? From Ohio to New York, Michigan to California, this morning the beef shortage at Wendy's is spreading. Where's the beef? Now one analyst estimates nearly one in five of the fast food giant's restaurants is out of beef. The company says it's still supplying burgers to locations up to three times a week, and we're working diligently to minimize the impact to our customers and restaurants. But other fast food chains that rely on fresh beef are watching closely as meat prices spike as much as 25 percent. You're going to have some near-term impact. We don't know how long that'll go for. Grocery stores like Kroger and Costco have already limited meat purchases after coronavirus outbreaks infected thousands of plant workers across 19 states. Authorities in Pennsylvania now say there have been confirmed cases at 120 facilities in that state alone. If you want to keep the food supply safe, you should keep the workers safe. That's where you should start. Roberto Esposito's family has owned this New York butcher shop since 1932, the height of the Great Depression. He's worried about the domino effect of a meat shortage. It could affect also the holidays like Thanksgiving, Christmas, or New Year's because as this goes longer and longer, you know, production takes time to, to raise cows, you know. And there's mounting anxiety for farmers who are scrambling to keep up with skyrocketing demand, but are dealing with a broken supply chain. I'm not going to lie, there is a lot of nights where I don't sleep very well just thinking about perhaps what will be happening in the weeks to come. It's, it's unsettling and it's scary. This morning, the meat industry is in crisis. But we're stuck between a rock and a hard spot. We want workers to feel adequately protected, obviously, but we also want people to enjoy the safest and the best pork product in the world. The farmers we spoke with said that this is not a supply problem on their end. They have enough. The issue is processing and distribution, the supply chain, during a pandemic. Savannah? All right, Gabe, thank you. And let's turn now to where there is hope this morning. There's tremendous optimism over a new vaccine trial. It's now underway right here in the U.S. And researchers say it could lead to a vaccine within just months. And this trial is different because it involves trying to manipulate the virus's genetic code. NBC News has had exclusive access inside these trials. And Tom Costello joins us now with that story. Tom, so many people are hopeful about this. It really turns vaccine research in a totally different direction. Yeah, absolutely. This is 21st century cutting edge medicine. So the bottom line here is that rather than working on a live portion of the virus, they're trying to manipulate the genetic code to reprogram the protein that makes people sick. And Pfizer, the company behind the research, thinks it could have a vaccine for emergency use as soon as September. At NYU Hospital in New York, shoulders out for a groundbreaking vaccine trial. And this one is different. Rather than building a vaccine from the virus itself, researchers from Pfizer and a German partner are instead trying to alter the virus's genetic code. NYU Chief of Infectious Disease, Dr. Mark Mulligan, is leading the trial. It was just in January that the, the viral sequence was first published. 
Um, here we are uh, less than four months later and we are launching a trial here in the U.S. Among the first 12 healthy Americans to get the injection, yoga instructor Melissa Honkinen. Melissa learned of the need for the volunteers from her husband, a doctor at NYU. We live so close. I could just walk and um, just be helpful to um, humanity at this time. Researchers think this trial could lead to an emergency FDA vaccine approval by September. They'll take longer to ramp up production and roll out. Here's what's interesting. The vaccine carries the genetic code known as messenger RNA that instructs the cells to make the proteins associated with the coronavirus, but without making someone sick. The hope is that the immune system will kick in to create the antibodies to fight off COVID-19. And Pfizer is now testing four genetic vaccine variations. There is always risks with every new vaccine and treatments. I do think the urgency here, their tremendous medical need and the suffering seems to outweigh those risks. Because it's a natural genetic process, doctors believe the risk is actually low. But outside experts caution it's still experimental. The big question that trials have to answer is, will the vaccine be effective? Will it be able to produce a good protective response against infection with COVID-19? And will it be safe to use? So Pfizer is trying to get 8,000 volunteers signed up in the coming weeks and months across the United States, not just NYU, but several states. And this is what's critically important here. Doctors believe we could be dealing with variations of the COVID-19 virus for decades, decades. So if they can manipulate the genetic code easily and reprogram it for each variation of this virus, that could go a long way towards allowing all of us to resume our normal lives, not just this year, not just in next year, but in the years to come as we see the variations of the virus. Savannah, back to you. I'll take that one, Tom. Thank you. We hope we get they get that one right. Thank you. Now to the breaking news overnight. Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg hospitalized after being treated for an infection caused by a gallstone. NBC Justice correspondent Pete Williams, he joins us now from Washington, D.C. Pete, what's the latest? Well, Hoda, a statement from the Supreme Court says that tests on Tuesday detected a gallstone that was causing a blockage and an infection. But Justice Ginsburg did not need surgery, and this did not stop her from taking part in this week's first two oral arguments ever conducted by phone. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is in the hospital this morning after she had non-surgical treatment for a benign gallbladder condition at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore. It was detected Monday after the court's first ever telephone session of oral argument. This week, the court resumed hearing argument by conference call after a two-month hiatus caused by the coronavirus pandemic. Justice Ginsburg asked questions during those telephone sessions both Monday and Tuesday, and the court says she plans to take part in today's as well. She's now 87, appointed in 1993 by President Bill Clinton, and is now the most senior of the four liberals in the now 5-4 majority conservative Supreme Court. She's also the oldest serving justice. If she had to step down for any reason, President Trump would be able to make a third appointment to the court, creating an even stronger conservative majority. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is also a pop culture phenomenon with her own cult following. And her life hit the big screen in 2018 as the subject of the film On the Basis of Sex. What did you say your name was? Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Justice Ginsburg has survived a string of health scares in recent years. Last summer, she was treated for a cancerous tumor on her pancreas, and she had surgery in late 2018 for lung cancer. But she has vowed to stay on the Supreme Court for as long as her health permits. And the court says she's resting comfortably and will probably stay in the hospital for a day or two, but she plans to be back on the phone this morning when the court resumes hearing oral argument by conference call. Oda? All right. Pete Williams for us in Washington, D.C. Pete, thank you. It's now 716. Let's send it back to Savannah. All right, Hoda, here's one. I'll give you a lift. Last week, New York got the treatment. People in Texas and Louisiana are going to get it next. A one-of-a-kind air show. The U.S. Navy's Blue Angels will fly over the Dallas-Fort Worth area as well as Houston and New Orleans early this afternoon. This is a salute to those on the front lines of the pandemic. The Blue Angels, along with the Air Force Thunderbirds, have also flown over Washington, D.C., Baltimore, and Atlanta in recent days. It's, it's quick. 
but it does get your heart pumping if you get to see it. It is. It's a beautiful sight, Savannah. All right. Uh, what do you say we get a check of the forecast from Mr. Roker? Hey, Al, morning. Hey, good morning, guys. And something we didn't see all winter is now happening in the spring, the polar vortex, believe it or not. As we show you, uh, generally, this is a permanent situation over the Arctic. And what we get is a frigid low pressure zone. Usually these strong winds keep it up there. However, the winds have weakened now this spring and allowed lobes of cold air to surge to the south from Minneapolis, Chicago, New York. This system, storm system, will collide with that cold air Friday night into Saturday wet snow for the interior northeast. Saturday into Sunday, we're looking at cold, blustery winds across the northeast. Snow showers from upstate New York on into New England and parts of even Pennsylvania. And this will then push on in, bringing in some light snow as it makes its way into the northeast, New England, and even the spine of the Appalachians.